Last year, Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs won Best Fiction Podcast at the People's Choice Podcast Awards. This year, we hope to do it again, but we need your help. Visit podcastawards.com at the link in the description and vote for Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs under Best Fiction and Best Male Host during the nomination period. And in return, I'll tell you a really cool story. Starting now. Welcome to this special presentation of the unabridged audiobook of Near Death, a rainy day investigation on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs fiction podcast. Near Death introduces Dr. Jennifer Day, anthropology professor and parapsychologist, to skeptical police detective Nate Rainey. It is inspired by the life and work of co-author Lloyd Auerbach and was originally brought to life as a screenplay by myself, Lloyd, and my longtime writing partner, Arnold Rudnick. In near death, Nate nearly loses his life during a robbery and is, in fact, clinically dead at one point. When he recovers, he struggles to make sense of information he seems to have gotten from a dream that helps him track down the robbers who shot him. Jennifer is convinced he had a near-death experience, but he remains skeptical, finding logical alternate explanations for what's happening. While Nate's on medical leave, Jennifer convinces him to join her on an investigation she's conducting for a woman who has an unwanted ghostly visitor. Their efforts end with them solving a decades-old cold case. So sit back and enjoy Near Death. A Rainy Day Investigation by Rich Hosick, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach. Chapter 14 Nate didn't want to risk driving, so he hailed an Uber through his phone and rode to the police station in the car of a very talkative woman named Naomi. Naomi, Nate learned, was a developer for a startup in town, but drove her Uber before and after her day job. She seemed to think it was Nate's fault he was taking her further from the office she needed to get to after this ride, and at one point even asked Nate if he would mind getting out about a mile from his destination so she could get back across town before nine. He couldn't tell if he genuinely felt sorry for her or just wanted to get out of the car and away from her complaining, but agreed to get out a few blocks from the police station. Once she had driven away, he gave her a two-star rating and started walking the rest of the way to the 10th precinct. The streets were busy, equally so with cars, bikes, pedestrians, and buses. Nate never really had time to take a walk and just enjoy the city. Usually he was in his car or Max's, and in too much of a hurry to pay attention to anything but the task of getting from one place to the next. On the occasions he did get outside for a run, his mind was on a case, and he would often listen to audio recordings he made of his notes, hoping that something would jump out at him and break the case. But now there was no urgency. The bullet had given him an unplanned vacation from the hectic pace of the job. Today he wasn't running or rushing or even thinking about the robbery case. He had left the file at home. Technically he wasn't supposed to have it, though he expected the captain assumed Max would slip him a copy at some point. When he got dressed that morning, he was able to wriggle into a t-shirt. But trying to manage one of the dress shirts he usually wore, let alone a necktie, was too much to attempt at this point in his recovery. He did put on a clean and pressed pair of slacks and a sport jacket. It was more the type of ensemble Max would wear, except his partner would definitely substitute a pair of high tops for the loafers Nate was wearing. Either he was starting to heal, or the pain pills were becoming more effective, because moving his arm in and out of the sling was much less painful than it had been the previous days. He felt even more like a civilian without his gun and badge. Those were in the bottom of the robber's duffel bag, or more likely at the bottom of the bay he would have to fill out a rather large stack of paperwork to get replacements. As he drew closer to the station, the concentration of police increased. Some recognized him and offered cheery hellos and welcome backs. Nate knew most of the officers in the precinct by name. It was something his Uncle Bill had always drilled into him. Make every cop your friend. You never know when you're going to need him to be one. Of course, these days, him was just as likely to be her. But the axiom still held. Nate made a point of remembering the name of every patrolman, officer, and detective he met. And when the hat was passed for gifts or donations, he always had his wallet out and was as generous as he could be. The station was set a bit back from the street. There was a small plaza in front of it, and more officers were gathered there. 
Nate returned their greetings with a smile and a nod and made his way into the precinct. Everything was on one floor. Normally he would park around back and use the rear entrance, but it felt more appropriate to come in the front since he was technically a civilian. Max would certainly tease him about being such a stickler for the rules. He approached the desk sergeant and started to print his name awkwardly on the visitor's log. Detective Rainey, no need to do that. Go on back. I know the gang is anxious to see you. Thanks, Roy, Nate said. He finished filling out the log regardless, then walked to the door that led to the detective's bullpen. Sergeant Roy buzzed him in. Nate pulled open the door with his left hand, careful not to twist his torso in such a way as to tweak his injury. Inside, he walked down a short hallway flanked by offices, conference rooms, and storage areas. It opened up to a nest of desks, arranged in pairs, facing each other. He saw Max sitting on his desk, chatting up one of the female patrol officers. Nate caught his eye. Max stood up straight and began applauding. Nate thought it was a joke at first, a sarcastic response to his premature return to the department. But soon others joined in, and all other noises in the room ceased, as it was filled with the sound of applause. Captain Bodie stepped out of the partitioned area that served as her office, joining in on the accolade. Nate shook his head and raised a hand for them to stop. It took a while for the clapping to end. When it did, they all looked at him expectantly. "'Go ahead, say something,' Max said. "'Well,' began Nate. "'Thank you. It's nice to be back. Good to see all of you.' "'Geez, never mind,' Max interjected. "'I thought you were going to say something interesting, or at least funny.' "'Sorry, I left my prepared remarks at home.' "'Yeah, along with your shirt and tie. You're going all Miami Vice on me, Nate. I like it.' "'Purely temporary until I am once again bidextrous.' "'That anything like bicurious?' Max asked. Some in the room laughed. Nate looked around and then teasingly said, Hey, aren't you guys supposed to be out there finding the guy who did this to me? He asked. We're waiting for your lists, his partner joked. Nate smiled. You know, I could get you your own legal pad, a couple of pens. It's not that hard. I'll leave the thinking to you, partner. Just point me in the right direction once you've found them, Max said. Rainey, Lee, my office, Captain Bodie shouted across the room. The impromptu celebration of Nate's return broke up as Nate and Max wound their way through the maze of desks to the captain's office. By the time they reached it, she was sitting behind her desk, her attention on a file open before her. Nate and Max entered. Max closed the door and they both took seats in front of the desk. Captain Bodie looked at Nate and smiled. Welcome back, detective. How are you feeling? Not too bad, all things considered. You mean the thing where you were shot and nearly died? Max asked. That's one of them. How's the shoulder? she asked. Nate knew the meaning behind that question. Was he ever going to be able to come back? That's good. The doctors say with a minor surgery or two, it'll be like new. I'm glad to hear that, Captain Bodie replied with relief. I expect that your partner has been keeping you up to date with the developments in the case. You filled me in, Nate said. The captain regarded both of them with a suspicious look. I have a feeling he did more than that. She turned to Nate. Is there anything else you can tell us? Anything you remembered? Something you might have seen or heard them say? Get in the caddy, echoed in the back of Nate's mind. The words from his dream. The words he couldn't possibly have heard or even known that they were said. It was pure imagination, a fantasy of his mind. Nothing to share with the captain. No, he said plainly, but I did have some thoughts about making a call for dash cam footage. Already on it, the captain replied. I haven't seen anything. Went out on the late newscasts a few days ago. It needs to go out every day. TV, radio, the papers, on the web, Twitter, Facebook. Slow down, detective, the captain said. We're chasing every lead and idea we can think of. You know the stats on something like that. It was a long shot that someone captured anything useful, and that that person heard the request and that they still have the footage. Nate sagged. She was right. They'd be better off committing their resources to other avenues of investigation. The more time that passed, the likelihood that such evidence existed diminished exponentially. He just wanted something to do. I appreciate that you want to help, but what we need you to do is heal. The investigation is our job, the captain said. Nate nodded. For a moment he considered telling her the robbers had a Cadillac and were hiding out in the Tenderloin. But that was just a desperate reaction to being shut out. He didn't want to pollute the case with random dreams, no matter how eager he was to be a part of it. I know, Nate said. Make sure nothing interferes with your recovery. I can't afford to lose you for longer than I have to. Thanks, Nate said. That said, the captain continued, I also can't afford to do without your instincts and talents as a detective. 
so I do want Detective Lee to keep you apprised of any developments in the case with the expectation that anything you might think of, remember, or any inspirations or revelations you have, you bring directly to me. Don't try to investigate this on your own, or even with your partner. Do I have your word on that? Nate nodded. Yes, ma'am. I'll keep him in line, Max promised. Nate and Captain Bodie exchanged a worried look. What? Max asked. I can wrangle a one-armed old dude. The captain waved them away and returned to her file. Oh, by the way, thanks for the gift. Max said you helped pick it out. She indicated a set of hammered copper planters on the credenza, the very thing Nate had told Max not to get. Nate and Max left the office and returned to their desks. You got the planters? You said over your dead body. I figured getting shot was close enough. Their workspace was a study in contrasts. Nate's desk was orderly and clean. Max's was buried under an inch of paper, fast food wrappers, and empty energy drink cans and bottles. Come on, I want to show you something, Max said. He led Nate to one of the conference rooms they used when working on a complicated case. There were photos, reports, and notes on one wall. On a whiteboard was a list similar to what Nate had written down on his legal pads. I thought you didn't do lists, Nate said. Yeah, don't be so surprised. I am, Nate confessed. I didn't think this was your style. Hey, just because I let you take the lead on our cases doesn't mean I can't. You actually have been rubbing off on me. I mean, I'd have to be an idiot not to follow your lead, considering how good a detective you are. I can't tell if you're serious or if you're mocking me, Nate said. Really? The great detective Rainey can't figure something out? Max teased. Nate had to laugh at that one. <laughs> Touché, he said. So why don't I walk you through what we have and you can fill in any gaps you see, Max suggested. All right, lead on. Nate said. Max took him through the timeline he and the other detectives had put together. Like Nate, they had assumed the suspects had spent some time casing the job and had gone back to canvas the other businesses on the street, checking for security camera footage or any loose ends the robbers may have left behind. There were none. At least none that they had found so far. One would think that on such a busy street, someone would have seen something. But it actually worked the other way. There was so much going on that none of it registered. Nate offered a couple suggestions for lines of inquiry Max could pursue, but it was all long-shot stuff. The squad had come to the same conclusion he had. Unless the suspects made some stupid error, they weren't going to be found. Their best shot was the fact that they had stolen so many personal items. They had inventories from the shoppers of what had been stolen, and the team distributed the lists to every pawn shop in town. Chances were they had an out-of-state fence to launder the proceeds of their crime through. But they may have tried to unload some of it before they left, and one slip would be all that was needed to catch a break in the case. After spending most of the morning comparing notes, Nate could tell Max was getting bored. Max wasn't a sit-in-the-room-and-think-about-the-case kind of cop. He preferred being out in the street, but a lot of police work was done at a desk, and Nate was glad to see that Max was starting to appreciate that fact. But he also could appreciate that there was a point of diminishing returns with Max, and he had squeezed as much out of him as he was going to get in one morning, and walked him back to their desks. I think I'm going to call it a day, Nate said. Something Nate said triggered a memory for Max. That reminds me, he began. Day. Professor Day. He shuffled around some papers on his desk. Dr. Jennifer Day? Nate asked. Yeah, that's it. She's from some university. Came by saying she wanted you to be a part of some study she's doing. Something about people who nearly died. Near-death experiences. Yeah, how did you know? She paid me a visit in the hospital. Really? She's pretty hot for a teacher, right? Max. She's a professor of anthropology at a prestigious state university. Granted, she does have a potentially unhealthy interest in some borderline macabre topics. But you go straight to she's hot? Yeah. Did you get her number? Nate shook his head. Just when I think you're making progress. Is that a no? She left her address, but not her number. But if you're not going to call her... Max continued flipping through papers on his desk. Nate laughed. Okay, I'm going to go home now. I reached my max max for the day. Yeah, you don't want to overdo it. You heard the captain. You need to heal. And listen, don't hesitate to call if you need anything. Seriously. Thanks, Max. I appreciate that. Need a ride? No, I'm good. He holds up his phone. Meeting new and interesting people in the gig economy. Yeah, Uber is a great way to meet women, Max added. Is everything about meeting women with you? Max considered. No. Not all the time. Let's leave it at that, Nate suggested. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Okay, boss. Take care of that arm. I will, Nate promised. Max started gathering up papers and came across a sticky note with a name and address on it. 
Wait, here it is. He handed the paper to Nate. Nate took the yellow paper square and without looking at it, slipped it into his jacket pocket. Max walked him out to the front of the station. They exchanged words with some other officers on the way, everyone promising that they would get the guys who shot Nate. But at this point, his expectations were that it would become a cold case if it wasn't already. Nate pulled the slip of paper out of his pocket and tried to decipher Max's illegible scrawl. He did make out an office number and building name he recognized from the times he had been on the campus of Cal State Hayward. He wasn't interested in pursuing her romantically, nor was he buying into her near-death nonsense. But in his experience, someone who went to this much trouble was bound to keep on hounding him, and it was better to head it off early rather than letting it get out of control. Chapter 15 Nate found himself standing in front of an imposing building on the Hayward campus. It was not the building he was heading for when he arrived at the university. That was an office building that housed, among other departments, professors from the anthropology department. But when he located the office number that was written on the scrap of paper Max had given him, he found a man in his mid-thirties, sitting behind a folding table, who flew into an incoherent rage about that nut job stealing his desk when Nate asked about Dr. Day. Eventually, Nate was able to discover that she was currently lecturing at a nearby hall. He followed the directions of a friendly student and entered the auditorium where Dr. Day was conducting her Introduction to Anthropology course. The auditorium seated a few hundred people at maximum capacity. It was a bowl-shaped room with a circular stage at the front, an array of large, curved LED screens showing digital slides behind the speaker. Jennifer was wearing her usual tweed pants along with a dark turtleneck, her hair pulled back. She looked very professional, aside from her bright red vans. It was a contrast to the flirtatious disguise she wore when she visited Nate in the hospital. She had a commanding presence as she spoke. The students hung on her every word. Jennifer had a reputation for delivering an interesting and fun course, and it filled up fast at registration. It was actually a source of conflict with her colleagues in the anthropology department. Many accused her of resorting to cheap parlor tricks to garner attendance at her lectures, which was true. She shared her love of magic with her students, often incorporating a volunteer into her weekly demonstrations of ledger domain. But five minutes a week of tricks and illusions alone were not enough to capture the attention of undergraduates, especially when she had to fight with the duo of social media and smartphones for their attention. Many students were surprised that she didn't enforce a no-phone policy like other classes. But those who thought they might need the distraction to pass the time quickly discovered that putting the phones away for an hour and a half a few times a week was worth it. It may have been the magic shows that drew them in, but it was Jennifer's knack for making her subject matter relatable and relevant that kept her attendance rates among the highest at the university. She'd even been invited to give a TED Talk on the subject of anthropological links to the afterlife. Nate took a seat in the back, trying to be as inconspicuous as he could. He managed to squeeze into a spot surrounded by enraptured undergrads. He bumped his arm a couple times, which caused him to wince. But once he was seated, he settled into a pain-free position. He glanced at the image displayed on the screen behind Jennifer. It showed a corridor lined with statues representing the gods of ancient Egypt. The concept of an underworld is an idea that is common to many civilizations. Jennifer cycled through a few more slides depicting Egyptian murals illustrating various stages of death and the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that you were guided to the underworld through a corridor by the gods. The slides moved on to artistic renderings of Charon ferrying souls across a dark ribbon of water and the Greeks believed that souls were escorted across the river Styx to the entrance to Hades. And the Chinese have stories of a realm called Diyu, a sort of underground afterlife maze where your soul is judged. A common thread in many of these myths is a journey from the world of the living to that of the dead, a transition that takes place, crossing a river, being guided down a corridor, entering a maze. In each of these belief systems, and even embedded in the concepts of reincarnation, is the existence of a soul or spirit, a part of a person that moves on, either to the next life or a new life. Even Native American cultures have a belief in spirits, ghosts, and an afterlife. They certainly weren't influenced by the Greeks or Egyptians. What could inspire so many divergent civilizations to come to believe in such similar ideas? Because ghosts are real, said one student somewhere near the front. Jennifer smiled. Maybe. A lot of cultures have deities associated with the sun, the moon, the earth, the things that make up their world. They have creation myths because they see life being created all around them and simply extended to the whole of the world. They see sick children cured by a shaman or a priest, and they believe in miracles. What caused them to believe that the soul exists beyond the life of the body? Maybe there are ghosts. 
Maybe every culture has experienced encounters with spirits, and like other elements of their belief system, constructed the concept of an afterlife to explain it. A young woman in the middle of the auditorium raised her hand. Jennifer nodded to her. Couldn't it just be hallucinations? I mean, that's something all human beings are susceptible to. Visions, seeing things that aren't there as a result of mental illness or psychotropic drugs. Certainly the existence of commonalities between a cultural belief system isn't by itself evidence of the existence of ghosts or a soul. Jennifer nodded. That's correct. The human mind is very susceptible to deception. That sounds like a segue, another student said. An excited murmur spread through the hall. Jennifer held up a hand until it was quiet. Then she checked her watch. After a brief moment, she clapped her hands together. All right, she said. Who wants to help me out today? Nearly every hand in the room went up. Jennifer scanned the students. Nate shrunk into his chair as her gaze swept past the area where he was sitting, but she noticed him instantly, fixed her gaze on him, and smiled. Detective Rainey, I didn't know you were auditing my course. Would you care to help me out with my demonstration of psychic ability? Nate adjusted his posture and smiled back. I don't think so. Seems like you have much more eager volunteers to pick from. Jennifer nodded and continued scanning her audience until she pointed at one young man casually raising his hand near the left aisle. Jeremy, come on up. Jeremy got up from his seat and walked up to the low stage while Jennifer got a box from a hiding spot in the rear of the platform. She set the box next to her lectern, then began pulling out stacks of books and placing them precariously on the podium. There were well over 30 volumes of different sizes, colors, and thicknesses. Jennifer stood aside, looked at Jeremy, and waved her arms at the books. Pick a book, any book. Some students laughed at her paraphrase of the beginning of every card trick ever. Jeremy crossed over and inspected the hardcovers stacked in front of him. He pulled out a thick one in the middle of one of the piles and read the title. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Not my favorite book of the series, but certainly a more than adequate movie version. But you kind of ruined the trick. Pick another one, but don't tell me the title this time. Jennifer turned her back on Jeremy and the stack of books. Jeremy grabbed another book, this one not as thick, and replaced the previous choice. Okay, got one. Good. Now I want you to just flip through it, put your finger on a page without looking at it, just pick one at random. The student held the book so that he could flip the pages with one hand while he selected a random page with the other. Okay, he said. Now what? I want you to take the highlighter from the podium and highlight any sentence on that page. This isn't a library book, is it? he asked. The students chuckled. When you're done, I want you to read the sentence to yourself. Don't read it out loud. Just say it inside your head, slowly, clearly, distinctly. Okay. Jeremy made a show of staring at the page and moving his eyes over the words, mouthing them as he read. And don't move your lips, Jennifer added. More laughter. Jeremy resumed reading, concentrating intently. Jennifer put a finger to her temple, as if trying to remember something. Do it one more time. I almost have it. Jeremy took a breath and silently read it again. Okay, got it, Jennifer said. She crossed over to a whiteboard mounted on a wheeled stand, walked behind it, and scribbled something with a squeaky marker. Now, without losing your place, hand the book to someone in the front row. Jeremy passed the book to a girl in the front row who stood up. Jennifer emerged from behind the whiteboard. Hi, Meredith. Would you read the highlighted passage out loud? Meredith turned to face the other students and cleared her throat. Some people said Humpty Dumpty, looking away from her as usual. Have no more sense than a baby. Alice through the looking glass, Jennifer said knowingly. Meredith consulted the cover of the book. That's right. Jennifer went to the whiteboard and spun it around. Written on it in big, bold letters was the sentence from the book. The class broke into applause. Nate leaned forward, playing back the performance in his head, trying to see the trick. Are you really psychic? Meredith asked. A magician never tells. A tone sounded, indicating the end of the class period. Students started gathering their belongings and exiting the lecture hall. Some of them passed by Jennifer, begging her to tell how she did it, but she just smiled in reply. Nate waited for his row to clear before attempting to make his way out. A couple students had to squeeze past him, but he didn't get his sore shoulder jostled this time. Once the way was open, he got up, sidled out into the aisle, and walked down the steps toward the stage. Detective Rainey, I'm so glad you could make it, Jennifer said. Nate finished walking down the aisle, waiting for all but a few students to leave before replying. You say that like you were expecting me. Well, I figured if I showed up at the police station looking for you, you'd either give in and agree to talk to me about your near-death experience, or you'd track me down and tell me to stop bothering you. I'm hoping it's the former. Stop bothering me. 
Nate replied with a hint of a smile. You could have told me that over the phone. You only left me an address, and a wrong one at that. Right, that was before we moved. Sorry about that. I may be a mind reader, but I'm not so good at precognition. You're not a mind reader. You're a magician, and a good one at that. Thank you. But seriously, you cannot go to the police station to try and question me for your so-called research. Hmm, we're still at so-called. I would have thought that since you sat through my lecture, you'd realize that death is a serious topic of academic inquiry. I only caught the last five minutes. I'm not completely convinced that you didn't slip that in when you saw me enter to try to persuade me that your academic inquiry is legitimate. You caught me. I switched out my slides in mid-lecture. I was actually talking about primitive body mutilations before you walked in. Interesting that no one else noticed. Students these days. Jennifer finished putting the books back in their box. Then she turned back to Nate. So, you really just came all the way down here to tell me to back off? You're putting a lot of effort into not talking to me. Nate ignored her comment. We're in the middle of a very time-sensitive investigation, and I don't need any distractions. Interesting. A moment ago I was a bother. Now I'm just a distraction. I think I'm growing on you, Detective Rainey. Just stay away. I have a lot on my mind. Jennifer put the box aside and stepped off the stage to speak to Nate directly. That's exactly what I want to know. You may not see any connection to what you went through, but I've talked to hundreds of people who've been in your situation, and there's always more to it. And I can promise you, keeping it bottled up is not going to make it any better. You have got to be the most arrogant woman I've ever met. Really? You should get out more. Nate shook his head. You think you know me? Know what I'm thinking? Know what I'm going through? I'm not some volunteer in one of your magic tricks. I know, Jennifer said gently. I also know that part of you came here today because you have questions that you can't answer on your own. Things you may have experienced or seen that you can't explain. I came here because you left me an address and no phone number. Jennifer smiled, busted. But I bet you're also wondering if just maybe I'm not a complete charlatan and I might have some answers. I've seen your show. I know the answer to that. I'm a cop. I deal in facts. If I can see it, I believe it. So, you're making the assumption that our sensory organs allow us to perceive everything that happens around us. What's your point? Have you ever been in love? I think we're getting a little off topic. Haven't you ever felt that rush when you meet a woman you're instantly attracted to? Your heart races, your palms sweat. She stared directly at Nate. Your eyes lock, and for a moment the rest of the world just dissolves away. Maybe it's love at first sight. Maybe it's just lust. But in either case... You do feel something. And? Can you see it? Can you see love? Can you touch it? No, of course not. Then you don't believe it exists? Nate seemed offended at her accusation. I can't see the abstract concept, but I saw the way my mother treated my father. I saw how she sat by his bedside while he wasted away from cancer. I saw her mourn his passing, missing him so much that she turned to shysters and con artists, disguised as mediums and psychics who bled away all his insurance money with promises that she could speak with him again. She still... Nate let his last sentence hang in the air between them. I'm sorry, Jennifer said, reaching out with a compassionate touch on Nate's arm. But I'm not those people. You enable them. You perpetuate those ideas. Give them credibility. I'm a scientist, Nate. I search for evidence the same way you do. The comment made Nate cringe. The way I used to, he thought to himself. Jennifer sensed his discomfort. I'm guessing you're going crazy not being able to chase down the men who did that to you, she said, nodding at the sling. You're obviously not in any physical condition to be doing the work of a police detective. And even if you were, I'm guessing there are policies preventing you from contributing in any meaningful way. Nate looked away. I have an idea. Kind of a challenge, actually, Jennifer suggested. Nate perked up, curious. Me and my team do investigations from time to time. People call us thinking they're haunted or have a possessed tea set, or want us to check out something some dime store medium told them. The last bit caught Nate's attention. His mother had spent a lot of dimes on those phony psychics over the years. Possessed tea sets? he asked. It was just mice, but occasionally we do come across something we can't explain. So, what's your challenge? Well, you're sidelined from your job as a policeman for a while. Why don't you come out with us on the next case we catch? Give it a skeptic's eye. To what end? 
Let's say we investigate some incident and it turns out that there isn't any logical explanation for it. You don't have to agree that it's paranormal, just that you can't explain it with science or chicanery. Okay, I'll play along. What if? Then you give me one hour of honesty about what you experienced when you were dead. Nate paused, then let out a dismissive snort. I told you, I didn't experience anything. Okay, it'll be a short hour. What do you say? And if we don't find something that can't be explained with a little common sense, I'll buy you dinner. Nate was surprised. We can go to Giorgio's. They have a great wine selection. Oh, are you an enophile? She smiled at his ostentatious use of vocabulary. Yes, I'm a fan of good wines. In fact, I used to work part-time as a sommelier in college. I promise, I won't talk about ghosts or death or anything fun like that. Nate laughed. He hated to admit it, but she was right. She was growing on him. God, did that mean Max was right too? Nate shook off the thought. What do you say? Jennifer asked. She extended her left hand so he could easily shake it. Do we have a bet? Nate shook her hand. All right. The handshake lasted a moment longer than it needed to, and Nate found himself noticing that her hands were smooth and warm, and she gripped his hand firmly. Jennifer smiled. Great. I'll need your number. Don't want to have to go through that guy at the police station again. He's a little creepy. Yeah, I worry that he has a hashtag me too moment in his future. Nate broke the handshake, then realized he didn't have his wallet or any business cards with him. Jennifer pulled her phone out of a deep pocket. I'll just type it in, she offered. Nate rattled off the digits of his phone number, and Jennifer saved it to her contacts. Well, I should be going. I'm supposed to see my orthopedist this afternoon, he told her. All right, I'll be in touch, hopefully soon. Looking forward to it. The dinner, that is, with a bottle of Mouton, 1988. Good choice, Jennifer agreed. I guess we'll see. Nate nodded, turned away, and started walking up the aisle to the exit. Jennifer watched him go. She looked down at his name in her phone and smiled again. Not a bad-looking guy, she thought to herself. For a cop. Thank you for listening to Near Death, A Rainy Day Investigation by Rich Hosek, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction Podcast. If you're enjoying this free presentation, I hope you'll post a review on Amazon, Goodreads, or Audible. That, and sharing this podcast with anyone you know who enjoys audiobooks, are the best ways to show your support. If you'd like to know more about the hosts of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs and learn about my other novels, visit richhosick.com and stop by rainyanday.com for more information about this series. That's R-A-N-E-Y and D-A-Y-E dot com. Thanks again and all the very best. Seriously, if you can pop on over to podcastawards.com and help me out, that'd be great. Bedtime stories for insomniacs, best fiction, and best male host. I owe you one.